Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by... BHG is a full-service accounting firm serving Memphis and the Mid-South region for more than 60 years, combining community involvement with the technical resources of a national firm. For more information, visit dhgllp.com. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The mayor's race heats up. An expanded convention center is proposed. All that and more tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined this week by a roundtable of journalists, starting with Jackson Baker from the Memphis Flyer. Thanks for being here. Bill Drees, senior reporter at the Memphis Daily News. And Bernal Smith, publisher of the Tri-State Defender. Thanks for being here. Thank you. We will start with the mayor's race and the debate that was earlier this week, which you have some familiarity with. You were right. there, one of, the, one of the many panelists who were there. Let's start with you and your reaction to the debate, which was on uh, WMC, um, but also just what, how it sets the stage for where the campaign's going now. I mean, it's, we're in the kind of faster and furious era stage it seems absolutely and it was uh fast and furious relative to, to a few fireworks there particularly between uh, uh wharton and strickland uh but I, but i think it really uh you know sort of set the tone and clearly um it, there's four candidates that are sort of interesting and will you know get, that have people's uh attention uh and i think that uh, both mike williams and uh harold collins to a degree sort of uh, had a chance to kind of assert themselves as, as legitimate candidates uh, that people could consider. So, um, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, Warden and Strickland kind of tried to say, hey, we are the front runners and, you know, these, these are going to be your choices. Yeah. So. Bill, your, your take on the last week of some campaign headquarters opening. I mean, really getting, last time we did a roundtable, we all had talked about how it seemed like it was just a real quiet phase. It was surprising. There were some yard signs out in the month or so since we talked about it. Clearly, things are really heated up. Yeah, and, and I think the different timetable for this mayor's race reflects uh, what, what a, a historic election it, it could be because you're talking about unseating an incumbent here. That's what the challengers are, are, are trying to do, an incumbent who is regarded very fondly by the electorate, who, who has won previously with 65 percent of the vote. Um, and that's no easy task. Uh, but there are some serious questions about, about Wharton's administration and his ability to get things done, and these challengers reflect that. And, and, and I would agree, we saw more of Collins and of Mike Williams than we have before in this debate. Neither one of them have as much money as Strickland or Wharton right. do. So that's why their campaigns have been a little bit later in getting started. But Collins in particular, I think, is going to be a force to be reckoned with in this. And Williams has some legitimate points to make that are going to add to the discussion. Jackson, your turn. I, I, I totally agree with both my colleagues on that. Uh, four candidates of the five who were on television for the city to see acquitted themselves very well. And the way in which they did so is interesting because the two front runners, and they still are the front runners, the Mayor Horton and Jim Strickland, um, achieved um, some really genuine sparks and some points for themselves by attacking each other. Now, that's good in, for both of them in the sense that people do vote for personalities that they, rather than people who have a set of issues. Right. When A.C. Uh, a. Horton, he, if he has a, uh, another side, it's being too smiley and bland. Um, so when he got feisty and attacked Strickland, that was good for him. He, he showed some real right. sparkle. Yeah. Now, and Strickland, his problem is he gets straight jacketed in, in, into his bullet points and just, you know, just do those over and over. And in response to the mayor's attack, he got vigorous and witty. Good for him. Mike Williams, uh, I think it was a real revelation. That was his coming out party the other night. Uh, he was articulate on more uh, issues than people thought he would be, perhaps. Collins was good. The only one who didn't measure up was Sharon Webb, but I, I, think, I don't think we'll see her in any further debates. These four are going to fight it out from now on out. And... Uh, to the extent that Collins and uh, Williams continue to be in free debates, get free media, 
they're going to change the, the, the way in which right. the, the, the two front words uh, deal with you, each you other. You were nodding when you were talking about Wharton getting feisty because sometimes he really yeah. does try, you know, the one Memphis campaign right. from, the, from, what, four years ago exactly. and all that. And he, he's kind of, people talk about liking him being a gentleman and so on, but he right. was feisty. Right. He was angry. Oh, yeah. yeah, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, people really needed to, uh, at least what I hear from people in the community is that, you know, they really want to see that that he's a fighter, that he that he'll come out exactly. and fight on their behalf, and you know that that he has a little of that that in him. And surely, as a as an old uh, trial law trial trial lawyer and uh, defense attorney, that he you know he has some of that in him, uh, and I think he showed it. And I think it was it was good for uh, for the for the voters to kind of see, hey, you know, this guy will come out swinging uh, on occasion and and uh, get on a, a offensive. Uh, and, and kind of defend his position. And I guess he has to because to, right. to, whether it was directly attacking him or attacking kind of passively, you know, the state of the city, but I mean, all the kind of passive ways in which the other candidates, the challengers, it was all an attack on Wharton to some degree. Yeah, and, and folks in his campaign were, were concerned that he was not responding vigorously enough. So right. we, we saw a pretty dramatic ramp up uh, actually going into the debate, starting with, with the weekend opening of his campaign headquarters on Poplar Avenue. This is a strategy that is not without its risks, however, because it means to some extent abandoning what is the incumbent's traditional advantage, which is I'm the incumbent, and if I go out and do something, I'm doing it as the incumbent and not as a candidate. Uh, you know, r relying on things th that he has done. Well, and I, I've said on the show, and, and I think I'm sort of being proven wrong, w I thought he would run, Wharton would run on sort of bright, shiny objects, you know, the Bass Pro and the, the big, you know, Graceland Hotel and big projects, positive kind of things. And I know and he is talking about those things, but there been, it's been a tumultuous time. I mean, the cuts to the unions, the, there are some really angry constituents out there that he... These, these other challengers seem to have really tapped into that. And so he's got, I guess he's got to defend himself in a way I, I honestly didn't expect. One uh, of his major themes, in addition to the bright and shiny things, is uh, a pitch to the millennials. He does, does that big time. Bike lanes is, is a good synecdoche right. for all that. Uh, he, he, he's pitching to a future generation of voters, some of whom are coming into the booze this year for, for real. But he's talking about a generation hence and the things he's, he's proposing to the city. Whereas Jim Strickland is talking about keep keep the city safe, keep it fiscally sound, get rid of blight, and that sort of thing, the present tense. And uh, Collins and, and Williams are sort of in that line, too. Um, there is, we can't get away from the fact there is a demographic issue here. To the extent, particularly, that the mayor pitches to millennials, and he has certain problems in his administration, which all mayors have in these times, um, he's at risk uh, in both the white and the black communities. Strickland has a lot of white vote. Re uh, uh, Williams is going to get a lot of black vote if he continues to be, uh, to be featured like this. So does Collins. AC is the only one who has both kinds in some quantity. What, what, you're taking that ask about the Edmund Ford letter, actually, but go ahead. Right, well, yeah, I was, I was going to mention that, too, but clearly, um, you know, th that kind of breaks out fairly well, but what I see Williams as uh, a candidate who uh, you know, has some passion and has some appeal, but I think you know th those that are, are, are hardcore voters. When you look at the numbers, you know the appeal of the millennials may be good, but but historically, if you look at the trends, those those folks are not mass voters. The voters, and particularly particularly in the black community and the white community, are those that are 50 and up. And so, uh, you know, I think I think Warden has to really have a message that uh, that really says, hey, here here are the things that our administration has done to impact your life. I think it, it, there's a referendum almost on, you know, how has this administration truly impacted my life in a positive right. way? And right. he's got to get that message out there right. versus, hey, uh, the folks that are challenging his, his record and saying, hey, you, you, you haven't really... It you, you haven't done those things. Yeah, and you, you, know. you, you see it in the, in, in the, you saw it in the questions, you saw it in, in the way to, that Wharton de defended his, his record that, look, I cut, you know, benefits to the police, I cut uh, spending, but we had to. What was the alternative? And you got an interesting, I thought one of the most interesting things was Mike Williams saying, 
you know, because people have said, well, you want to restore these benefits and it's be real expensive. What are you going to cut? He said at one point what he would cut, if, and to paraphrase, was, you know, all these economic development things, all these expanded convention centers or back, all that's great, but it just right. needs to wait. Right. And I thought yeah. that was actually really an interesting yeah. thing because yeah. normally politicians say we can do it all. Right. Wharton has tried to say we can't do it all. We couldn't afford those benefits. And Mike Williams said we need to afford those benefits and we need to put some of these other things on hold. Now, I'm not saying I agree with that or what, but I thought it was interesting no. that he tried to to address one of the criticisms and, against and, and And that's going to happen more with, with these three challengers. When he says, you haven't put anything up, they're going to be able to say, especially Collins and Strickland, oh, yes, we did. We brought in a, a, an actuarial consultant and came up with our own numbers on what right. exactly the liability was. The whole discussion about millennials, I, I think, is interesting, too, because on that, there is particularly a, a, a great discussion happening between Collins and Wharton on this particular point because Wharton is emphasizing the bike lane and uh, the bike lanes and, and, and the opposition that he's encountered to it when he pitches to millennials. Collins is scoring heavily with that group too, I believe, because he's saying, I have daughters who are in college who, who have graduated and they're like other millennials who do not want to come back here because they don't see jobs here for college-educated yeah, young right. professionals. Yeah, yeah. So, it, it's an interesting pitch. You know, mm -hmm. that, so you point to some of the things like, you know, Electrolux or Bass Pro and say, you know, that's a minimum wage job. That's not appealing to, to millennials. And okay. Collins has hit that again and again. Yeah, Someone $9, $10 on, jobs. Is yeah. Pitch, yeah. Someone hit on the Edmund Ford letter, though. Do you, do you want to talk yeah, about Yeah, well, I can, I can do that. that, that, was, that Edmund was, Ford Sr. We should Edmund Ford, well, that, that, that's an issue because when we saw it in our uh, email boxes, I know Bill had the same reaction I did. I looked at this and wiped. <laughs> and one of, uh, I thought we thought it was Edmund Ford Jr. at first. You thought, you mean he's, a, he's attacking his colleague, Harold Collins? And then, then you look and say, oh, it's senior. Right. Okay, right. who used to be a councilman, is now out of office. Um, and is he, the question is, is what he said was that Harold Collins was actually in the, in the race to help Strickland, right. not to win in his own right. 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 Now, which would be uh, to, 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 to drain off black Drain off black vote. Right. Drain off so black Collins vote. is going to be more appealing to the black vote. Strickland doesn't have a history of appealing to the black right. vote. And so that he... So the black vote comes from AC's vote. Totally AC's vote. vote and and, and right. in walks Strickland. Now, uh, what's it's a great about, conspiracy theory, What's interesting about that, <laughs> that thesis that, that, that uh, uh, Edmund Ford Sr. put forth is the effect of Collins' candidacy in a certain way does work that way. But I don't think Collins is doing it for that reason. Collins is in it to win. Right. And if Collins gets right. enough black vote um, right. and he rises and shines in other ways, he could win. Yeah. And he tried to put himself, we'll wrap up this debate, and he tried to put himself above the fray and tried to, you know, we'll be seeing more and more of that, I think, too. Yeah. I should also, we're, we're, the Daily News and Urban Land Institute are doing one of the forums that's coming up that'll be broadcast live on, on WKNO in September, right before early voting starts. Last, uh, Let's move on a little bit to other political things um, because we we'll have more time to talk about the mayor's race as, as the month goes on. Um, the Joe Cooper and, and Jim Kyle and the election commission. Tell us, Bill, what happened because it's actually an interesting thing that we're going into election season and some a, a, a sitting judge locally really chastised the election commission for some of the things it's done. Right. Joe Cooper, a former Shelby County commissioner, wanted to run in the Super District 9 position 2 race, an open seat on the Memphis City Council. Uh, the problem was he had not had his citizenship rights restored from a 2007 federal conviction for money laundering. Um, so the, uh, the, he didn't get those rights restored until maybe five days after the filing deadline. He filed the lawsuit in Chancery Court to get back on the ballot. Jim Kyle, the Shelby County Chancellor, who the case was before, ultimately said, no, you're not going to be on the ballot. But in, in his decision, he also was somewhat critical of the Shelby County Election Commission for uh, things that... that Cooper claimed were said to him about you have to have this, you have to have your citizenship rights restored if until you do, you can't even collect names on your on your qualifying petition. You have to stop doing that right now. Um, Which was uh, out of bounds from Jim Kyle's point of view. Yeah. That they were not, that is yeah. not their rule to tell people how to run. It is simply to collect the, the signatures they bring or don't. Well, he, right? he, he, yeah, he went even further. He was even blunder on the point. He said it's not the job of unelected officials on the election commission to tell 
people who can and cannot run for office. That's that's right. a decision that comes from the courts and Chancery Court in particular, whose judges are elected. Yeah, it, it was interesting because sometimes we get these lawsuits that feel, and I'm not saying this about jo Joe Cooper, but mm -hmm. they feel like sour grapes lawsuits after an election. This was interesting. It's real wonky, but it, it's interesting, the real criticism of the Election Commission, which has come up before. But Jackson, you Well, it's not just the Election Commission because uh, Joe Cooper was complaining that the, the DA's office refused to meet with him uh, early enough so he could get his rights restored. He, he, uh, and basically they were they weren't crazy about doing that. That's kind of obvious. <laughs> but why did why he waited until the last couple of weeks before the deadline to start pressing this issue is an issue. So a lot of a lot of the culpability lies right. with him. Yeah, right that, man, that's what I say. I mean, I mean, you you know your situation. I mean, you know that there's a process by which you have to go right. through to be eligible right. to run for public office. Uh, you know, given uh, that history, so. Uh, you know, I, I think it's in, in some instances a lot, to, you know, a lot to do about nothing. Uh, but, but clearly, uh, I think there was room for chastisement of the election commission relative to, you know, how they, you know, handled that right. process to even get to that point. Yeah, right. You know? That to me again is the interesting part. I mean, you know, you, I didn't even know that he was eligible to ever running. I mean, the, that's a that's a different issue for me, the Cooper thing. But the criticism of the election commission is notable. Uh, last, and, last and, word. Interesting enough, he'd been campaigning for six or seven months without uh, getting his rights restored. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, right. was, I mean, that's exactly, that was the that's amazing the thing. Right. Uh, you still got a sign up on the roadside. And, 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 and ultimately, it was a Joe uh, Brown sign up. Or something. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and ultimately, the timing is, is what killed him. He, he got yeah. this controversial right. uh, opinion from the election officials a month before he went into yeah. court to try to do something uh, about uh, it. Let's touch quickly on the county commission. Um, the Steve Baser was head of the county commission for approximately one hour. Right. What, what, what in the world happened? What, what happened? And then we'll get your guys' comments uh, on it. This is the annual chairman selection at the Shelby County Commission, which for about the last five years has just been a no-holds-barred mm -hmm. contest. I mean, I think one year it took 26 rounds of voting before the, election, before the, the county commission mm -hmm. got a chairman. In this case, it only took six rounds. And Steve Baser emerged with seven votes to become the chairman on the sixth ballot. So that's that's decided. I think we're all kind of looking at each other, going, "Well, this was this was easier than it than it has been about the last three years." Ho hum meetings over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and so the county commission moves on through the rest of its agenda. So I'm live tweeting it, and I type in. That's the meeting after the last item, and I'm just about to hit send, and there's this little voice that just says, no wait. And when I did, when I waited, Eddie Jones, county commissioner who had voted for Baser, moved to reconsider, and the whole thing was open again, and the commission couldn't agree on who they wanted to elect as chairman in those three rounds of voting. So Baser was chairman for about okay. an hour. There's a whole lot of backstory to this, and, and uh, one of the more obvious things is that Baser had been vice chairman two years ago. And in the old days, if you were vice chairman, you got to be chairman the next year. That's not, by, not by law, but by practice. By, 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 by courtesy precedent. Um, that's no longer the case. really has been the case for a while, but he assumed he was going to be elected last year chairman. And he was astonished when he found out that his fellow Republicans were not supporting him. Right. Now, there were various reasons why they weren't. Uh, but in any case, subsequently, after he was denied the championship, Justin Ford, who's a Democrat who votes with the Republicans, uh, 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 was the chairman. And he, uh, Baser joined with the other Democrats on the commission, the series of moves trying to remove Justin Ford as chairman. It didn't quite work. They did limit his powers. But at any rate, throughout this whole year, Baser has been sort of a de facto Democrat, voting with the Democrats on a lot of key issues, including the budget most recently. And he also he has burned a couple of his colleagues. Um, Heidi Schaefer is a budget chairman. For th two years in a row, he made a big fuss about wanting somebody else for budget chairman. She doesn't forget things. And, and there are various other people who had grudges of that sort. So, so when it came time, Eddie Jones was, uh, he, he had a certain allegiance to Terry Rowland, who was a candidate, and that was finally, he voted for Baser, but that right. was in vote. Finally, he changed his mind. So what is this? I mean, this stuff is great sort of political sport for us to write about in our various papers and to talk about here. But what does it say about the County Commission's ability to get done? Because a certain number of people watching this going, hey, get it together, people. Right. And, and, and act like adults. Yeah. So the interesting thing is that, you know, after this uh, last county election and we had a lot of new faces and new personalities, you know, the, the thoughts were, well, well, we'll get past some of these shenanigans and, and sort of, right. you know, a lot of the 
political folly that was happening in P P Pass County commissions, and then it looks like, well, here we are, you know, back in that same situation, and we got an interim chair in Van Turner who, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it, it's, it's just the more, well, the more things change, the more they seem to stay the same. Yeah, they, they're, they're doing good on September 14th. Right. They will have another vote. Don't be surprised if Van Turner doesn't become a candidate on September 14th because he hasn't offended anybody yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, yeah. Dan will be on the show <laughs> next week talking about right. tax collections with the trustee and so on. Right. Um, let's go to the mm. convention center. Um, it, it's an interesting proposal bill in part because the mayor, when we go back to the mayor's race, um, there's a lot of talk about economic development. I talked about Mike Williams, but everyone has talked about what's it take to, to revitalize, what kind of jobs do we want, and so on. Just give us, if you would, the outline of the, of the proposal for the short term and then the long term vision of an expanded convention center. Sure. The idea here, which is being pitched by the Convention and Visitors Bureau and, it, and as well as the Wharton administration, is that you spend about $54 million up front to renovate the convention center, put a new skin on the outside so that it matches the Cannon Center uh, and do some upgrades inside. Beyond that, there are several hundred million dollars over a much longer period of time that could p expand the convention center and push it out all the way to the river's edge. Um, this is something that Mayor Harrington had mentioned as, a, as an option, although he envisioned maybe moving all the interstate ramps that are there right. to expand it to the west, because otherwise it's landlocked on all the other sides. Um, this would go under, over, around those ramps and go right to the river where you would, uh, under this very long-range plan, I have to emphasize, yeah. would have a several new year. hotels right there right. on the river's edge at the harbor. They look at, I think it was a $400, $500 million in the long term um, expansion of, mm -hmm. that would be government money and then hoping for, you know, hundreds of millions more in private money, which has happened in Nashville and they point to Austin and some of these other places. And that what they point to is, and we'll try to get Kevin Kane and some of the other downtown people and city council on um, uh, in the coming weeks to talk more in more depth about it. But um, there'll be a tax increase, 1.8% increase in the hotel bed tax and $2 bed tax increase. I think I said that correctly um, uh, in the short term for the funding. But your thoughts on it. I mean, this, it, does, it is an interesting thing with the political notion of, you know, part of the reason they want to expand there is because Bass Pro is driving so many people in. and. Right there's less reason to leave that end of downtown and that back to the politics is Wharton saying, hey, look at me, look at yeah, me. Yeah, you know, I, I think, I mean, I was the one that posed a question uh, to Mike Williams and of course his, his response was, well, you know, we got, you know, uh, deeper problems to deal with rather than, than just the convention center. But clearly, uh, you know, if Memphis uh, wants to be uh, competitive and then when you hear uh, Kevin Kane talk about you know, so, sort of the, you know, what the needs are. Uh, clearly, if we're, if you look at what Nashville has done and you look at some of the cities that we're competing with for conferences and, and, and those kinds of things, there's got to be something done uh, to, to make us, to up, update that convention center, to create more right. hotel space and, and, and all that. So that there's, there's a balance. I don't know if this sort of short-term Band-Aid uh, approach and then, you know, a slow incremental, uh, you know, implementation is the, is the answer, but right. clearly we got we, we can't just keep doing what right. we're doing. Because right now we're not competitive with Nashville. Right. They built all. their huge ones, not so we're in a different right. we're in a different right. class in terms right. of. And, and we've had a year to see how just how much that, that is meant to Nashville. The brand new right. Gala Coliseum they've got there, uh, and we are hurting in the competition. Something had to be done, and politically, it's interesting because a year ago, you may remember, AC was making a, a proposal that we have an out. We just connect some things outdoors that we already have via our trolley system. That's our new convention. Right. He you talked said, about Peabody. He said to move on from that. You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Trying to add Peabody Place into that mix. And yeah. 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 That was sort of a weird proposal, but it was like, okay, well, we got to do something. Right, right. And a lot of people, well, again, we'll do a, we'll try to do a full show on this in, in the coming weeks. Um, let's talk just a couple minutes left. And uh, Governor Haslam was in town recently. He's doing a statewide push on infrastructure spending. The, the basic framework here is there are about $6 billion in statewide projects, uh, highways, bridges, and other 
in Memphis, most notably, the Lamar corridor connecting, you know, through the whole distribution area, uh, there's a backlog. And that is in no small part, and it's getting worse because the gas tax. The gas tax is about 21 cents a gallon on gasoline, um, and it hasn't been moved in almost, in give or take, what, 25 years, Yeah, Bill. since Ned McWhorter was governor. You and I were both at the governor's presentation. It was at the chamber, and it was, you know, a lot of people from the FedEx and logistics community, and they, make, they put a very compelling chart up on the board, which is that over the next 25 years, give or take, a million five people will move, an additional million five people will, will move into uh, Tennessee or the, the, the population will expand by that much. <clears throat> and during that time, cars will get 50% more uh, fuel efficient, which means that gas tax goes down as the needs for roads, bridges, highways, everything goes up. And it's a very compelling case. What was interesting was, and I think in that room with so many distribution people, and you talk about Memphis, just if he'd done a straw poll, would you like to raise the gas tax? I think he would have won that straw poll hands down, I mean, mm -hmm. without, without a doubt. But he didn't want to ask for a gas tax. He just wanted to listen. And it's a strange political world right now that, that um, he's not out there asking to raise money. He's trying to put a spotlight on a problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and the reason for his caution in this became evident this week because state Senate Republican leader Mark Norris, who was at the same chamber event that we were at, uh, came out against a gas tax hike. He just kind of blew through all of the thing about, I'm just setting the stage and just talking about We're this. We're just about 30 seconds left. Is this a repeat of Insure Tennessee? Um, it, with, with, with the difference, what he's doing this time, he's been burned there, so what he's doing this time, it's not say, he's not saying, I'm for this gas tax. He's going out saying, we can't do what you want. He's, uh, across the state, he's doing this. Guys, we need more revenue. He wants people to say gas tax. Right. Quick thoughts. On I, I, yeah, I think that's just a smart move. You know, you you, you make the, the you put the compelling argument out there, and you put it the ominous on, on the people to say, hey, right. You know, this this is what we need to improve infrastructure. All right. Thank you for being here. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. BHG is a full-service accounting firm serving Memphis and the Mid-South region for more than 60 years, combining community involvement with the technical resources of a national firm. For more information, visit dhgllp.com.